Well, thank you, Frank, for that nice introduction. And um, I'm very uh, honored to be addressing this audience today. And uh, I think this workshop is a great idea. Um, the idea of bringing together uh, music cognition people and the music informatics people. And um, my talk is going to be really about why this is a good idea and uh, some of the benefits that can come out of it. So I'm going to begin by uh, giving you my own view on these two fields of music cognition and music information retrieval and uh, how they relate to each other. So I would say music cognition and music information retrieval, MIR, are two fields with different, uh, similar subject matter but very different goals. So music cognition, I would say, is the musical branch of cognitive science. Um, and it involves the scientific study of cognitive musical processes using all the methodologies of cognitive science, behavioral, computational, and neurological. Um, always in the spirit of basic research or sort of knowledge for its own sake. And uh, I'm going to define music cognition here broadly to include any kind of cognitive musical process, and not just perception, but uh, performance and composition as well. So a music information retrieval, or music informatics as Frank called it, um, <coughs> I would say is the musical branch of computer science, computational engineering. And it's concerned with solving practical musical problems using computational technology. And uh, again, I'm going to define the field broadly, uh, including not only information retrieval problems and narrowly defined, such as uh, key identification, but also things like uh, generating expressive performances and uh, automatic composition. So despite this difference in purpose between the two fields. I think there's a lot of common ground between them, and they could benefit from interacting much more closely than they have. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to examine some problems that have been studied in both fields and suggest some ways that the two fields might learn from each other. And I'm going to be drawing examples from my own research. Uh, much of my research lies in sort of the overlap between these two fields, and sometimes I'm taking more of a cognitive perspective, sometimes more an engineering perspective. But um, I often find that a cognitive perspective is useful to my engineering work and, and vice versa. So part one, how MIR can help music cognition. So in, in music cognition, we often want to know how humans perform a particular process, like um, a perceptual process. And we can approach this uh, from an experimental viewpoint, and we often do. But we can also approach it computationally, just asking what has to be done to perform the process in the easiest and most effective way. And uh, this is a well-known approach in cognitive science, uh, most famously perhaps in uh, David Marr's work on vision, uh, but seen in, in many other examples as well. Um, but of course, this practical problem-solving approach is how people tend to approach problems in MIR as well. So that's really how MIR research can contribute to music cognition. Uh, just an, a caveat, so the finding a good computational solution to a problem, of course, does not prove that humans solve the problem in the same way. But it at least gives you a hypothesis for how they might solve the problem, which you can then examine in other ways, such as uh, with experiments. So I'm going to give an example from the area of key finding. And uh, key finding, or key identification, has been a problem of interest in uh, both music cognition and MIR. In music cognition, most of recent key finding models have been distributional. Um, most famously, uh, the Crumhansel Schmuckler model, reported in the Crumhansel's book, where you identify the distribution of pitch classes in a piece, and then for each key, you have a, an ideal distribution, although th they didn't really think of them as distributions, but one can. Um, they think it, uh, a sort of ideal distribution for each key, which, which we call a key profile, and then you uh, find the key whose profile best matches uh, the distribution of your piece. And this approach has been very influential in MIR as well, although in this case the key profiles usually represent chromas, that is um, the frequency bands in an audio spectrum uh, rather than pitches. 
So most key finding work is focused on classical music, but um, there have been a number of recent studies that have explored a key finding in popular music, and I've listed several here. There are several others I could have mentioned. And I've worked on this problem with uh, Trevor de Klerk, a former student of mine at Eastman, now at uh, Middle Tennessee State University. One might assume that key finding in rock works much the same way as it does in classical music, maybe with just slightly different key profiles. But it's also possible that it works quite differently and that quite different principles are involved. So Trevor and I used a corpus of 200 songs from Rolling Stone magazine's list of the 500 greatest songs of all time. Uh, this represents a broad spectrum of pop music from the 50s through the 90s. You can see this shows the top 10 from the list. We've got 1950s rock and roll, we've got the Beatles, the Stones, uh, but then we've also got some uh, soul Motown songs, we've got 1990s rock, so a, a broad spectrum of uh, late 20th century pop music. We began by analyzing the harmony of, of all 200 songs and transcribing their melodies. So here's the opening of Hey Jude, very straightforward sort of uh, Roman numeral analysis. And then here's how we transcribe the melody. Five, three, three, five, six, two, two, three, four, <coughs> one, etc. Using uh, scale degrees. <coughs> and the entire corpus is available at this website, and we also were reported it in um, reported on it in popular music a couple years back. We labeled the key of each song just with a tonal center, such as F or F sharp. Uh, we didn't label keys with major or minor since the major minor distinction is kind of controversial with rock. I'll get back to that. And we split the corpus into a 100 song training set and a 100 song test set. <coughs> and then we tried a number of approaches to key finding on this corpus. So our first approach was basically the crumb handle schmuckler algorithm. Find the distribution of scale degrees, that is pitch classes in relation to the tonic, in the training set. And then you just rotate that distribution along the chromatic scale to create a key profile for each key. And then for each song in the test set, you find the pitch class distribution of that song, which we call the input vector following from handle. And then we find the key whose profile best matches the input vector. And for matching the input vector to the key profile, we use a probabilistic method, basically minimizing the cross entropy between the two. Um, it, a little different from the correlation method that Crumb Hansel used, but the same basic idea of template matching. That is, a, a good key is one um, whose key profile has high values for the pitch classes that occur frequently in the song. So we tried this approach using two ways. First, we did it with the melodic transcriptions, and that was straightforward. Just count up the, the pitch classes in, in the song, and, and in the training set to create the key profile. And then for the harmonic analyses, we did it also. And this was a little uh, more complex. So here we had to generate pitch class distribution somehow. And we did that by assuming that each chord contains a single instance of each pitch class it contains. So for example, a C major chord would imply one C, one E, and one G. And here are the key profiles we came up with. Um, for the harmonic analyses and for the melodic transcriptions, you can see that they're quite similar. A couple of differences <coughs> that I could talk about, but basically pretty similar. And, and one way to think about them is they really represent the union of the major and natural minor scale. So any scale degree that's in either the major or the natural minor gets a pretty high value. The degrees with the lowest values, flat two and sharp four, are the two degrees that don't occur in either major or minor. A quick example of how this works. So the red shows, this is for the uh, harmonic model, that is using the, the harmonic pitch class distribution of, of the song and the harmonic key profile. And uh, the red shows the harmonic pitch class distribution for Hey Jude. The blue here shows the C major key profile, and now we're going to rotate that key profile to get uh, profiles for the other keys. C sharp, D, E flat, E, F, pretty good fit. F sharp, G, A flat, B, C flat, not bad, C. But the best fit is F, and that's therefore the chosen key, and that is in fact the correct key. And here are the results. So this is the number of songs in the 
100 song test set on which the model identified the correct key. Um, the harmonic model got 76 right, the melodic model got 78 right, and then we tried combining the two profiles to create a 24 valued uh, key profile. And um, that got 86 songs right. So we thought this was okay, but we wondered if we could do better. So some theorists, including me, have suggested that key identification in pop music depends partly on the pattern of roots and specifically on the way that roots are aligned with the meter. And in particular, the tonic harmony is especially likely to occur at metrically strong positions. Okay, here's an example. So here you see basically the same chord progression aligned in two different ways with the meter. And let's just think about what key these passages imply. First one is the intro to uh, Sarah McLaughlin's Building a Mystery. Second one, same chords rotated. Well, of course, these things are subjective, but I would say the first one sounds more like B minor, the second one sounds, like, sounds more like D. Um, and if you agree with me, then the question is why? And I would say that the answer is that in this case, the B minor chords are metrically stronger, and in this case, the D major chords are metrically stronger. Uh, that's assuming that odd-numbered measures are stronger than even-numbered ones, which I think is the usual assumption in music theory. Generally, the first and third measures of a phrase are stronger than the second and fourth. So we wondered if taking the roots into account and the metrical placement of roots could improve key-finding performance. So we divided the harmonic analyses into half-measure segments, and we found the distribution of relative roots in the training set. That's similar to scale degrees, except looking at roots instead of pitches. And we also distinguished between metrically strong and weak segments. So basically, a strong segment is the first half of an odd-numbered measure, and all the others are weak. And here are the, the root profiles, and you can see that indeed they're rather different. And in particular, the tonic occurs much more often on strong positions than uh, at weak positions. So given these root profiles, we can identify the key of a song in, in much the same way as we do with um, pitches, using the same distributional approach. And here are the results. If we just treat all the segments equally, we get 86% correct. And then if we introduce the metrical distinctions and distinguish strong mm -hmm. and weak positions, we get 91% correct. So it does seem like uh, distinguishing strong and weak harmonies can, can really help. And then when we combine this algorithm with the melodic pitch-based algorithm, uh, we get 97% correct, which we thought was pretty good. And uh, you might ask, well, how good is that compared to other models? And it's kind of difficult to compare. Um, I think it's, it's better than any other model that I know of, but most other models for key finding in rock and pop music use audio input, which you could say is, is a significantly harder problem than uh, the problem we're using, which is symbolic, where you have symbolic input, and, uh, or you know, where you have the harmonic analysis already done. And um, this gets into a big issue, actually, with, uh, uh, for this workshop, which is the issue of do we use audio input or symbolic input? And, Music informatics generally uses audio input. Music cognition generally assumes symbolic input, and that's uh, probably something we'll be coming back to, I expect, but um, I'm not going to get into it here. So we undertook this work just in the spirit of engineering, trying to solve the key finding problem in the best way that we could. But we think it has implications for music cognition as well. Um, I think it suggests that the listeners, too, may consider roots in, in key finding. Uh, this is something that I don't think has been experimentally tested, but it, it could be and should be. And I think our work also suggests that key finding in pop music might work in quite a different way from key finding in classical music. It, it, this hasn't really been looked at either, but I suspect that in classical music, the metrical placement of roots is, is not a big factor. Um, in classical music, you very often get um, the tonic harmony at the end of a phrase, which it tends to be a weak position, metrically weak position. Uh, but again, this would be a good area for experiment. 
But anyway, the moral is this is a case where an engineering approach to a musical problem raised some, I think, uh, sort of interesting ideas and questions uh, for the field of music cognition. Part two, how music cognition can help MIR. So the key finding problem, or let's call it the tonic finding problem because we're not looking at major versus minor, um, that's a very well-defined problem. It's clear what the listener has to do. They have to choose the right tonic out of the 12 possibilities. And in most cases, it's clear what the right answer is. So with a problem like this, I think an engineering approach can be really useful just as a way of generating hypotheses about how the process might work cognitively. But in other situations, the problem is not so well defined. It's not totally clear what computational problem the listener is solving. And in cases like that, I think a uh, experimental approach, a cognitive approach, can be really helpful to MIR to clarify things. So another case in point from my own work, again dealing with pop music, and it's the issue of scales and modes. So a very important problem in, in music informatics is grouping songs together by similarity, um, either in terms of style or genre, or in terms of emotional content, or maybe in other ways as well. And uh, it seems likely that one factor in this is the scale or the mode that the song uses, just as the, the major minor distinction is a very a useful way of, of sorting pieces in classical music. It's well known that the, the emotional connotations of a piece depend very much on major versus minor. Um, but then this raises the issue, what are the scales or modes of popular music? Do pop songs group into natural categories in some way by virtue of their the scale degree content, and, and what are those categories? And again, the issue of major versus minor comes up. And the validity of this distinction for pop music is, is controversial. Um, a lot of MIR studies and corpora assume that it is, and you often see songs being labeled as major versus minor. But some theorists have actually questioned this and have suggested that the major-minor dichotomy just is not uh, valid for pop music. So Trevor and I started out with a sort of engineering approach to this problem, um, again using the Rolling Stone corpus. We identified the melodic scale degree profile for each song, just as I described earlier. And then we clustered these profiles together. And we used k-means clustering and, and uh, some other clustering methods that yielded similar results. And actually, we did the same thing for the harmonic scale degree profiles, but the results were, were similar to the melodic ones, so I'm just going to focus on the melodic ones here. <coughs> and here are the clusters we came up with. We started out with just a two-cluster solution. Um, cluster one, I'm just calling them cluster one and cluster two. So cluster one looks a lot like the major scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven degrees of the major scale have the highest values. The other five are all very low. Actually, there's some evidence for the pentatonic scale, isn't there? Because the five pentatonic degrees have much higher values than, than the other two diatonic degrees. So that's a pretty clear result and easy to interpret. The, the, clus the second cluster is harder to interpret. You could say it's, it's more minor than major. Uh, because the flat three has a much higher value than the raised three. But the raised three also has a fairly high value. You could say it looks a bit like Dorian mode. One, two, flat three, four, five, six, flat seven. But then if you throw in the three as well, it turns into an eight note scale, which is actually kind of an interesting scale. Uh, we call it the pentatonic union scale because it's the union of the major and minor pentatonic scales. That's one way to think of it. You could also say it's a bit bluesy because it has both the flat three and the three. One, two, flat three, three. And actually, there are a lot of songs that use both of, the, both of those degrees. Um, one more interesting detail is that the flat six degree is quite rare in both clusters. And I'll come back to that. We also looked at higher cluster solutions, but they didn't fit the data much better than the two-cluster solution did. 
So you could say we've answered the question. Rock melodies cluster into two categories. One is major, the other is sort of minor-ish, similar to Dorian mode with a, some blues influence maybe. But is this really a satisfactory answer? Maybe not. So in a related project, uh, although at the time I was doing it, I didn't realize how related it was, uh, Daphne Tan and I, and Daphne is another former student at Eastman now at Indiana University, um, we examined the emotional connotations of diatonic modes. And there's a paper by us in Music Perception recently about this. Basically, we created melodies in different modes and we played them for listeners and asked the listeners to say how happy each one was. And uh, we got a pretty strong and interesting pattern of results. And in our paper, we, we discussed possible explanations for it, which I'm not going to get into here. But uh, one thing we wondered was whether familiarity might be a factor in listeners' responses to the modes. And we did an experiment to explore this, which I call the probe mode study. And our subjects were non-musician college students. And uh, we gave them a questionnaire, a free response questionnaire, just asking what what styles of music they listened to, and they li listed rock much more often than any other kind of music. So here's a uh, bit more detail about the experiment. Subjects heard uh, three major melodies in a diatonic mode, always with a tonic of C, followed by a one major ending, which was either in that mode or in another mode that was differed by one scale degree. And they judged how well the ending fit given the context on a scale of one to seven. Here's a couple of our stimuli. So here's an Aeolian melody. Aeolian is just natural minor. An Aeolian context. First you'll hear it with an Aeolian ending. Whoops. And they had to judge how well the ending fit given the context. Here's the same context with a Dorian ending. Ugh, I don't know why I always does that. Let's try again. And they would also hear the Dorian version of the context. So. Uh, Da, 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 with a natural, with both endings. So our reasoning was that if a mode was highly familiar to listeners, then an ending in that mode should seem to fit well compared to an ending in another mode. And we also wanted to know if the context would have an effect on their judgments. And we performed four separate experiments, each one comparing a different pair of modes. So here are the results, and um, it's a little bit uh, questionable to present them this way because it's really collapsing over four different experiments and each one used a different set of melodies. But I still think it's uh, informative. So this shows, given a context of mode X, it shows the average fit of an ending in that mode and then the average fit of an ending in a different mode. And you can see, first of all, that context does have an effect in that um, a, uh, an ending in the mode of the context generally seems to fit better than an ending in, in a different mode. Um, but I want to focus on differences between the modes. And to do that, it's useful to look at this minus this. And that shows you, given the context of mode X, how good is an ending in that mode compared to an ending in a different mode? And then you get this pattern, and you can see two pretty strong peaks, one at Ionian, which is major, and the other at Aeolian, which is natural minor. Now these two modes, or sorry, Aeolian and Dorian, the two modes I've, I've circled here, differ only in one degree, the sixth degree. Aeolian has the lowered, Dorian has the raised. Now our analysis of the Rolling Stone corpus uh, the minor cluster looked a lot more like this than like this. Um, that is, it suggested that the uh, raised six is a lot more common than the flat six, even in the minor cluster, right? Going back to that, even in, in the minor cluster, the blue one, the um, raised six is much more common than the flat six. The flat six is extremely rare. 
Yet in this experiment, the aeolian with a flat six seemed to be more familiar to listeners than the Dorian. So this, this puzzled us. Um, our subjects listed rock as a style they listened to more than any other, and so you might think the Rolling Stone corpus would represent their experience pretty well. But their responses favor Aeolian over Dorian, where, whereas uh, the Rolling Stone corpus suggests the reverse. Why is that? Well, remember that our subjects were present day college students, and um, much, if not most, of the music they listened to may well be from after 2000. By contrast, the Rolling Stone corpus pretty much ends at 2000. There are almost no songs in the corpus from after 2000. It, it really focuses on the 50s through the 90s, and actually most, the majority of the songs are from the earlier decades in that period, the 60s and 70s. So we started to think, or I started to think, this is just my own work. Um, but maybe the scale degree content of, of rock has actually changed in, in recent years, and so that sent me back to corpus analysis. And this is some work I've done very recently. I took VH1's list of the 100 greatest songs of the 2000s. Uh, that's the decade, the 2000s. VH1 is a, an American uh, uh, music cable channel. At least it used to play music. Now it just plays dumb reality shows, but <laughs> that's another issue. Um, and here are the top 10. You can see, again, a pretty wide range of pop music. It's got some sort of pop rock and, and some uh, Hip hop. There's quite a lot of hip hop in this top ten, but actually, if you look at the whole list, there's there's a broad range, and there's uh, a number of songs that are definitely rock. Um, so rather than doing complete harmonic analyses or transcriptions, I just identified the set of scale degrees used in each song, um, and I did this separately for the melody and accompaniment. So a little bit like what Trevor and I did for the melodies and on harmonic analyses in the Rolling Stone corpus. And I didn't attempt to describe precisely how much each scale degree was used, but I distinguished between primary and secondary degrees, where a primary degree really seems to be part of the scale of the song, and a secondary degree is only one that's used pass in passing or incidentally, like a note that, that occurs just in a couple of little vocal inflections or something. Here's an example for Beyonce's Crazy in Love. That's what my melody analysis looked like, and that's the accompaniment. And then I gave primary scale degrees a value of 1.0 and secondary ones a value of 0.5. So that converts that to this for, for the melody set. And then normalizing those values so that they sum to 1 creates uh, a distribution like this. So I've done 50 songs so far. and. For the melodic analyses, I created an average scale degree distribution over all the songs, which is kind of a key profile. Then I did a scale degree distribution for just the major songs, which I defined as the ones that use three but not flat three, or songs in which three seems to be more prominent than flat three. And then did the same for minor songs, which are ones in which flat three is more prominent than, uh, than three. So let's compare these distributions with those from the Rolling Stone corpus, and again, keeping in mind that, that the methodology is somewhat different. So here are the overall distributions. Several interesting differences here. In uh, the, the Rolling Stone corpus, three is more common, sorry, uh, right, three is more common than flat three, whereas in the 2000s corpus, the reverse is true. Uh, also, Six and flat seven gets, gets swapped. Six is more common than flat seven in the Rolling Stone corpus, and for the 2000s one, the reverse is true. And notice also that flat six is much more common in the 2000s corpus than in the Rolling Stone corpus. I'll get back to that. Now, just for the major songs, uh, no big differences here. They both clearly reflect the major scale. Now, for the minor songs, this is what I think is interesting. Um, largely pretty similar. But you can see that flat six and six are reversed. And in the Rolling Stone corpus, six was much more common than flat six. And in the 2000s corpus, the, the reverse is true. And this accords very well with the Aeolian Dorian preference that we observed in our experiment, right? The, the listeners seem to find uh, flat six more familiar than six. And uh, that's what we find in this uh, 2000s corpus. 
So it may seem obvious that uh, there have been changes in pop music in recent decades and that uh, the Rolling Stone corpus doesn't, doesn't really reflect what modern listeners hear. Um, and you know, the rise of hip, hip hop and other things you could point to. But I don't think it's so obvious that scale degree distributions have changed. I haven't really seen any discussion of, of this in the literature. And it, it's only the experiment that, uh, that I did with Daphne that brought this possibility to my attention. My footnote to this study, this is a very interesting study. And um, Schellenberg and von, von Sheba uh, did a corpus analysis of pop music. And um, <coughs> comparing recent pop music to music from a few decades ago. And they did find that uh, they were looking specifically at major and minor. And their conclusion was that there are more minor songs now than there were in er earlier decades. And that actually fits with what I've with what we found, right? Because the, um, uh, in the Rolling Stone corpus, the major three is more common, and in the 2000 corpus, the reverse is true. Um, so that is definitely an interesting and relevant study. But what I'm focusing on here is uh, really differences within the minor category, right? And that's something that uh, Schellenberg and Bonsheva didn't discuss. If it's true that scale degree distributions in pop music have changed, that would seem to be a, a very relevant and important uh, thing for music informatics. It relates to key finding, it relates to song classification, emotion labeling. It's something that uh, MAR people would probably want to be aware of. So this is an example, at least in my own experience, of how uh, experimental work changed my thinking about a music informatics problem. So, my conclusion is, MAR and music cognition can inspire each other. When, the, when you have well-defined problems, music information retrieval can come up with hypotheses for how they might be solved cognitively. And when your problems are not well-defined, experimental work can be useful to help define and clarify them. And the big moral is, music cognition people and MIR people should interact more. Music cognition people should go to Izmir, MIR people should go to SNPC. Of course, for all of us, there are more conferences we want to go to than we can. But um, music cognition people should read JNMR, MIR people should read music perception. Music cognition people and MIR people should collaborate. And there should be more workshops like this one. Uh, thank you for your attention, and thanks to my collaborators, Daphne Tan and, and Trevor DeClerc. Thank you. Well, I think I got us back on schedule. Yes. <laughs> Took a little less time than I thought I would. Finn. So, um, given that the scale degree seems to be shifting a little, and that students of today are interpreting modes a little bit differently, what do you think the impacts are on how this population is interpreting, let's say, environmental and cognitive corpus and music? Can you, can you expand on that? Well, um, how they're interpreting it, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm not sure I have a good answer. I mean, just in terms of familiarity, I would say that this suggests that the scale degree profiles of six, 1960s and 70s music are less familiar to modern listeners than the profiles that they hear in, in modern music. Um, but what that does for their experience of, of the music, I'm not so sure. W one of the things, as I said, the reason we did this experiment was to help us interpret the results of our, of, our, um, of our happiness experiment. And the results of our happiness experiment were, this is with, again, modern college students, present day college students. The results of our happiness experiment were, Ionian is happiest, major is happiness, happiest, and then it goes down like this, and also like this. So the pattern is like this, right? 
And so one thing that I think this experiment shows, we, we were wondering if that was all due to familiarity. And maybe major is the most familiar, and other modes get less familiar as you move away from major. And this experiment shows that that's not the case. Because this familiarity experiment, for this familiarity experiment, there's a big peak at AOE. Right? So uh, that's kind of a negative answer to your question, that I don't think, um, well, what I'm talking about here is familiarity, but I, I don't think that that alone accounts for the emotional or the expressive connotations of modes. Uh, I don't know, was it Peter? Um, so in some of the uh, multi profiles we were showing, you were um, focusing on the swap positions of the servers in unit six. But a huge difference in them was also the change in the tonic. You're talking about this one? Yeah, and I'm just wondering, I, I don't know what to make of that. That's, that's a very uh, good point. I had, hadn't even really thought about that. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I just don't know what, what to make about that. I mean, virtually all songs use the tonic. So if the tonic is, is higher, score is higher in the Rolling Stone corpus, I think that means that the later songs are using larger scale sets. Um, but that might also be an artifact of the, the differing methodologies because, uh, again, there, we, I use different methodologies for the two corpora. So um, really, I should do proper transcriptions of all the 2,000 songs like I did for the Rolling Stone songs, and that would, that would give a stronger basis for comparing them. Uh, yeah? So what does uh, Eric's just kind of, uh, I, mean, I, I mean it as a, um, as a kind of friendly question, you know, kind of for a field, but what, what do, I guess, how much would you say we need to know about participants? Based on your experience with these undergraduates and, and, and what happened in your experiment, has it changed your thought about how much you need to know about participants before you can interpret a proton experiment? I mean, we have a proton experiment so long and they're so important. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think does it, I guess, does what you found make you question anything that's that's in our long standing body of music perception literature? Do we need to go back and revisit anything? Well, I mean, any decent experimental study will tell you about the participants and, and will acknowledge the, the importance of that. And I think most studies do. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, Carol's Protone studies and, and others have, have, have uh, re reported what the participants are. And, and um, Carol's work and others, uh, uh, other music psychologists, have also looked at different populations and have explored the different kinds of Protone responses that you get with different populations. But I mean, I think you're, you're right that sometimes we gloss over that and, and we just say, okay, this is what. Uh, the key profiles look like without talking about, without being clear about what the subject population was. Um, and, and I do think this, uh, I mean, this makes me think that it would be useful to do, to redo Carol's experiments with the modern listeners because you might find that, uh, um, that the key profiles look rather different because they're, uh, I think their experience, their musical experience, may be rather different. Yeah. May I follow up really briefly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, I guess what I was asking wasn't in a specific, but I really, really mean it in a friendly way. Is, is there, I guess, if we did say we do, you know, the kind of famous proton experiments, well, I guess what new questions would you put on your participants' survey? I mean, yes, of course you look at the study and say, you know, are you male or female? You know, how old are you? And, and perhaps there's more information that may not get reported in the journal article, but based on what you're saying, are you Yeah, that's true, right. Well, what kind of music do you listen to? Yeah. That's right. I think that's a really important question. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, um, I was wondering, uh, and you probably have to speculate, how, how would you, 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 you have evidence for a change of kind of modes or minor major, major minor changes. What do you think is the cause of that? Uh, that's a good question, too. Yeah, um, well, sh I, 
Yeah, Schellenberg and von Schäfer talk about that, and that, that is, it is an interesting study, and I recommend it. And they, I think they sort of trace it to just uh, more sort of cynicism and uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of a darker a mood. In, it's a uh, very gentle conclusion. What? It's a very gentle conclusion. They don't push that. They don't push that. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. Um, but. Sorry, what? What causes the change? I I don't know. The the change music becoming more minor. I I really don't know. Um, yeah, uh, as I said, it's it's a very interesting study. But I mean, one thing that I have a, a problem with is that. Well, I, I do think the major, the whole major minor dichotomy for pop music is often problematic, and there are a lot of songs that mix the two. There's a lot of songs that have. Uh, that's another thing that Trevor and I talk about in our JM, JNMR paper. A lot of songs in the Rolling Stone corpus have a minorish melody and a majorish um, accompaniment. That is, like the melody is using minor pentatonic, and uh, the accompaniment is using all using a major one chord, and that's something that happens all the time. So. Uh, Simply grouping songs, I mean, I know I'm guilty of the same thing here with the clustering, but it's, it is problematic, and there's a lot of pop songs that really do interesting things with, with um, kind of blending major and minor. Sorry, there was a, yeah. When you're constructing your uh, distributions, I, I believe what you're doing is if you're counting the number of times each note occurs. Yeah. If you make, have you made these distributions instead of weighting each note by the amount of time it is spent on? And no. Um, one uh, could imagine that could have a big impact in principle on the yeah. distribution. It, it could. I think that would be worth doing. I sort of doubt that the shape of the distribution would change very much. My, my hunch is that it would probably increase the differences between the the more frequent degrees and the less frequent ones. But uh, yeah, it would be worthwhile to do that. Yeah. Just to do distributions, uh, I'm wondering about the error bars. So, like how, so different intervals, uh, how robust are they to the addition of another song? Yeah, Each of them that's a good them. question. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't shown error bars here. And it is a pretty small sample, especially the this 2000s thing is only based on 50 songs, so I, I really need uh, more data. It's quite true. Probably some of them will be robust, but others maybe less. Like yeah. Some interval. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing you pointed out that was remarkable about the Rolling Stone corpus is that flat text really doesn't show up at all. Yeah. Um, if, if, if you'd used the methodology that you used for the 2000s corpus, would they have crept in? Because there are these sort of yeah, you're right. It's it's possible. That that is possible. Um, but I don't think that could explain the flip. You know, I, I, I don't think that could explain why they. I mean, I don't think the difference in methodology could explain why. Um, uh, Ray 6 is more common in the Rolling Stone corpus and less common in the 2000 corpus. Um, I, I was wondering if, if it's possible to look at the, the, kind of the complexity of the key. Um, so if, 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 you, if you want to explain why, why that happens, if, if you look at the continuum from, say, something that's very easily fit into a key to something that's completely unknown, um, and it, it might just be some, some sort of preference for a certain type of melody that that kicks over that kind of average complexity in the key over to a different kind of mode. In, in, in terms of not, not, not a musical mode, but I mean like a like a like a complex distribution kind of thing. Mm. I'm not quite sure I follow. So, so you're uh, saying that some degrees can be easily integrated into a key and others can't? Yeah, like like I'm imagining that, that listeners have a kind of a preference for, for a certain level of atonality 
that as you approach, as you become more and more atonal, there, there's, there's kind of a there's kind of a sweet spot somewhere in there, and 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 so as as you as you go over that, it it um, it changes which which notes are clicked to make it more tonal, to make it fit into your key more more easily. Hmm. Um. Yeah. Well, I. I would agree that I think there's some kind of uh, optimal level of complexity, but I'm not quite sure how to relate this to that. I think that's that's a tricky issue. Yeah. Um, getting back to the whole participants thing, um, I, I know it's yeah. The, the studies say it's like a bunch of college kids, right? That's what's accessible. But has there been any studies that we've done with like different cultures or different? places to show variances Different cultures? Yeah. Yeah, there have. Um, well, Carol has some studies on uh, pro-con studies with uh, Indian um, listeners and uh, okay. other and uh, others have done um, some other cultures. So there's been there has been psychological work on pro-con studies, getting pro-con responses for, for di people with different backgrounds, and also using different kinds of um, musical contexts and seeing what effect that has. Uh, I haven't really done any of that myself. Okay. Well, I have a question about the first uh, experiment that you were showing today, the first analysis that you were showing about the um, uh, two different, um, like, um, strong, weak, weak, weak. Yeah. Um, so you, you based your analysis on this strong, weak, 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 where basically this strong, weak, weak, weak comes from the score, no? Uh, no, it comes from our own um, intuitions. Oh, well, it, actually, not not really. It comes from just odd numbered measures, and uh, and we transcribed the songs ourselves. We didn't look at music notation. We just transcribed them. We decided where we thought the bar lines were, and then we just looked at odd versus even measures. And um, that, but we found that correlates very strongly with our intuitions about what the strong measures are. I mean, there might, it's very rare that a song starts with a measure that seems metrically weak. Uh, now, there are some songs that have irregularities in them, and so it, it, it starts out with strong, odd measures being strong, and then it goes into even measures being strong. But even those are, are rare. This, this algorithm works pretty well in terms of pr matching our own intuitions about what the strong <coughs> measures are. But would you say that the harmony that you're listening actually uh, kind of buys it into if you want a strong uh, uh, music? This is, this is like a circle. This yeah, is that's a good point, and that may occasionally happen. I think it doesn't often happen in rock because the phrase structure tends to be so regular, and uh, there aren't a lot of hypermetrical shifts. Okay. I think that's more likely to happen in classical music, but it could happen occasionally. No, no. Yeah, that would be interesting, yeah. Because they, they may not really be mixtures of those keys at all. It might be something really outside that space. And that's why I was wondering if Well, sorry, you're talking about, what are we talking about exactly? But any profile. And any profile being a, a sort of a mixture of, of keys. Well, I'm not really saying it's a mixture of keys. I'm trying to get at the sort of underlying Categories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it may not be. It, it, it may be. It may actually be a mixture. Yeah, it's, that is. No, it may not be a mixture. It may not be a mixture. It's outside that space. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. <coughs> yeah, that would be interesting to look at. Yeah. Well, um, I guess uh, I'm in this talk. I'm kind of going back and forth between the two, the two issues, and or the two goals. And I guess in, in this part of the talk, where I'm talking about 
modes and scales, that's a problem that we approach just from an engineering point of view. But then we found out that this experimental work was, was relevant to it. But it's also a, an interesting music cognition question, too. So I guess part of the point is just the convergence of those goals. Yeah? Uh, in your studies, the experiments that you did, uh, you came into it with uh, pieces of music that you had already identified as having a key, and then built a model around whether or not the output of that model conformed with the previous label that you had given it. Yeah. Well, I think I think the um, the practical value of key finding is that it's just a basic kind of understanding of a piece that you need for um, in order to process the piece intelligently. I mean, I think to do any I mean, some might disagree with me, but I, I think and, and I know other people in music informatics have said this that to really make sense out of a piece of music, you kind of need to know what the key is, whether it's for uh, identifying the emotional content or identifying the genre or matching it, this is doing similarity matching with other, with other melodies. Um, it really helps to know what key it's in and to know that, you know, if you just see a, you know, CDE, you can't, that's not very meaningful, but if you know that scale degrees one, two, three, then that tells you more, or as opposed to scale degrees four, five, six, or whatever. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.